Good morning, Hope and Life. We are so glad that you've joined us this morning for our Sunday worship experience. Wherever you find yourself today, we are glad that you're with us. So I want you to just put all the distractions to the side. Don't worry about the dishes. Don't worry about the house. Don't worry about anything, but just take a few moments and really focus in on what God has for you today. As we go into worship, I just want to read a quick scripture to you found in Isaiah. It's in chapter 25, starting at verse 1, and it says, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you, I will praise you, and give thanks to your name. For you have done miraculous things, plans that were formed long, long ago with perfect faithfulness. No matter what your past is, your present circumstances, or your future, God has got it. As we go into worship this morning, go in expecting Him to do great things.
Our God is great and our God is strong. God, you are higher than any other. Yeah, our God is healer and he's awesome in power. Yeah, our God. Sing that again. Sing, our God is great. God is great. God, you are stronger. Our God is stronger. And Lord, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God. Can we sing that one time? Just the our voices. God. Sing, our God is. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. You are higher than any other, and our God is healer. You're awesome in power, our God. Yeah, our God. One last time, sing that. Our God is, our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any. Know him as healer. Our God is healer. He's awesome in power. Awesome in power. Our God. Yeah, our, our God. God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our God is great today, church. Hallelujah. No matter what it looks like, he's greater than that. Amen. He's greater than that. He's bigger than that today. Hallelujah. Woo, we worship you today. Jesus, we worship you today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to be close. Yes. Close to your side. So heaven is real. Angels. 
news today that he is holy, 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 holy. Amen. Father, we just lift our hands. We thank you today, Lord, that you inhabit, you reside in places just like this, where we, your people, Lord, press into your presence. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you woke us up this morning to bless us. And Father, we declare that you're holy. Great is our God, bigger and better and stronger than anything that we could ever face. So Father, we know this is the day that you have made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. How many are thankful today that the demons run, amen? That the enemy has to flee. You might be surrounded by the enemy, but how many know the enemy surrounded by the angels of heaven? You and I are surrounded by the favor of God. We are blessed and highly favored, amen? Come on, if you believe that one more time, can you give your God? Come on, give God a mighty hand clap, amen? God is good. Before you're seated, will you turn and look around to a couple of folks and say, God's here. Tell somebody he's here. Hey, folks, I've got some good news as well. How many like to hear some testimonies? Anybody like to hear some good testimonies? You know, the Bible says we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And so last week I talked about how we had a couple things even going on in our family directly. And Pastor Gwenny was not able to be here because our little dog that we love a lot, I think she's three years of age. Uh, which makes her 21, I guess, years in doggy age, right, or something like that. But Rooney had been dealing with some physical things, and so Gwenny really had to watch her stay at home. But this week, everything worked out, the medicine worked, but also prayer worked. I believe believe that God meets the needs of, of those that ask him for the big things and the small things. Come on, can I get an amen? That meant something to us. It's important to us. And so, thank God she's feeling a whole lot better because... I mean, if it came down to a whole lot of surgery, that can cost a whole lot. We ain't got no doggy insurance. Amen. So thank God that God answered. She's feeling much better. But today you might see I'm wearing a ball cap. That's not a usual thing for me on a Sunday morning. And you might have thought, who's that country singer? I look like a country singer up here today. Amen. <laughs> Clint, Clint Black or something like that. I don't know. But, uh, but many of you might know I've been diagnosed with uh, some skin cancer, basal cell skin cancer. That's not melanoma, which is the worst kind to have, but un- attended, you know, not looked at or handled, basal cell can get out of hand. And so there's a little bump that kind of rose up right through in the part of my hair. And so uh, it was Thursday of this week. I told the church on last Sunday, of course, that I was going for a, a, a kind of outpatient type of surgery, went in and if they didn't get it on the first swipe, they had to go in a little deeper. And I said, man, there's not much meat up there. How many know there's not much meat, much meat on top? If they go a little too deep, I don't know about you, but I need all the brains I got. Come on, somebody. Amen. So I was praying, I know you were as well, I asked those that were in the in-person service with us to be praying with me that that first time they went in, they'd get all they need to get and then I'd get out. Well, to God be the glory that everything was got on the first time in. And so uh, I'm cancer free today, amen. God is good. And I'm not making light of that because I know we have some folks that are dealing with some heavy situations and mine is heavy or dire if I let it go, but the Lord's help, nurses and doctors, Dr. Ferris helped me out, to God be the glory. Uh, Albert Artis, though, shared last week how he's dealing with a kidney issue, and there seems to be a lesion on there, and we're praying that he's not going to have to have that kidney removed, but that he's going to be healthy and whole, but he is a man of faith, and how many believe that God can meet his need? Amen? <laughs> Pastor Gwen is going to lead you in giving today. Come on, you let her know how much we love and appreciate her today. Amen. I love you too, church, and I thank you so much for praying for our sweet little, our little dog, Rooney. I know for some people that's probably like, what in the world? And I probably was one of those people a long time ago, um, but since Rooney has come into our lives, she's just such a little blessing to, to our whole family, so thank you so much for your prayers, and, and many of you just texted and called to check on her, and I really do appreciate that. Thank you so much, and I hate that I wasn't able to be here with you last week, but as Pastor said, um, as we're getting ready to take up our, our tithe and offering this morning, I just wanted to share a little bit with you um, from the story that is found in 2 Kings, and it's about Elisha and the widow that, if you know the story, she had lost her husband who was a prophet, and she goes to Elisha and says to him, you know, what, what do I do? What, 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 what's going to happen here? What do I do? And, and you know, it kind of would seem to think, you might think it would be a little insensitive because what he says is he doesn't, he doesn't stand there and console or say, hey, let me get my checkbook out and write you a check or let me go to others that I know and take up, you know, an offering for you. What does he do? He says, what do you have at home? What do you have? Now, she came to him with what was missing in her life, right? With the the loss of something important and dear to her. And he responds with, what do you have at home? 
And she responds basically, basically with just a, just a little, a little bit of oil, just a little. And he says this, he says, what? Go and go through your neighborhood and gather all the jars that you can gather, bring those in to your home. And it seems, like I said, kind of counterintuitive. It seems like a strange request. Instead of just, you know, saying, let me help you. Let me take care of you. He, he, he basically says, stretch your faith. Now, I don't think she realizes that at the moment, but that's what he's saying. Stretch your faith. And don't focus on what you don't have, but focus on maybe the little. It might be minor. It might be small to you and seem very insignificant. But to God, it's so much more. Amen? Amen. We know so many times, we've seen it time and time again. I know I've seen it in my life and I've seen it in family members and friends and those of you here at the church, I've seen it even operate in your life where there's something small that seems insignificant, but you sow a seed or you plant that seed and what happens out of that births a great harvest because God sees your faithfulness and he sees your heart and your obedience. And that's exactly what happened for this sweet little lady. And, and this is the thing in the story that always has just amazed me because when you hear the story and you hear what happens and you hear how every jar that she gathered, basically it's like this. When you, when, when said, you know, go into your neighborhood, it's, it's like, okay, go to Decula and go to, you know, uh, Buford and go to um, Snellville and go to Lawrenceville and just run around and get all the jars that you can. And that's what she does. But you know, it's amazing. And this is the part that I love about this story is that out of that and out of her obedience to do as Elisha asks her to do, she gathers jars and takes them into her home. Now, for whatever reason, I don't know if she knocked on every door and there wasn't any more jars to be found, or maybe she just stopped when her hands got full, I don't know. But you know what happened? The oil did not stop because the jars were, were, were full. Every jar in her home was full. The oil stopped because there were no more jars to supply the oil, which speaks to me and says, you know what? No matter what my need is, and no matter what your need is, God will supply everything that you need. Amen? He will supply and he will fill every jar that's available. But you know what? I wanna ask you this morning to stretch your faith, maybe beyond what you think you could hold in your arms the amount of jars you could gather together and hold. Stretch your faith and believe for even more that God has for you, amen? And don't focus on maybe what you don't have. Focus on your big God who wants to do so much with maybe the small amount that you do have. Maybe it might be a sacrifice to put $20 in for a book bag for a student. But you know what? I know and believe in my heart without any doubt, and I've seen God prove himself time and time again, that he is gonna honor your faithfulness in doing that. He's gonna honor your obedience as you take that step of faith, and he's gonna bless you for it. Amen? He will, I promise you that, church. It's time now for us to say our statement of faith. And so if you would just repeat this with me this morning as we just give unto the Lord and thank him with grateful hearts for all that he's given us. Amen. Upon the authority of your word, I have given and it shall be given to me. Pressed down, shaken together and running over. I'm a tither. I bring my tithe today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved and walking with God. Perfect health and abundance to walk in divine favor and blessing. I'm blessed going in and I'm blessed going out and all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. As pastor has said so many times, everything that we've just spoken and we've just declared, that is all biblically referenced right there. We've got scriptures that will reference everything that we said. We don't say it to just say it. We say it because it's the word, amen? So this morning, if you would just bow your heads with me as we go before the Lord. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have, Lord. With grateful hearts, we come before you, Lord, now just to be obedient and step out in faith, God. We thank you for what you've blessed us with, and we thank you in advance, God, for how you're going to just continue to see us through. Lord, we thank you. We bless you. We honor you today, Lord, with our gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Hey guys, thank you for giving. I know when you received that challenge just a moment ago from Pastor Gwenny, uh, let me just tell you, she was speaking from personal experience. Her and I both have seen how the Lord has just provided, how he's filled up uh, just those that are willing and able to offer to him um, just a, a faithful response to that area of giving. Just like the lady that had those vessels, God continued to fill all the vessels that she provided because God, takes care of us. He makes a way for us. He's a Jehovah Jireh, which tells us that he sees our need, knows who we are, but then also he has the power to provide for our needs. So thank you for doing that. Got a couple of announcements just real quick I want to make you aware of, and it'll give you another opportunity to give if you feel led uh, to, to, to do that. One is uh, within the area of our county for back to school. Back to school, it's going to, it's already starting up the next, next couple of days, but we're gathering supplies all the way to the 15th of August. That is the third Sunday, because today's the first, so the third Sunday in August will be the last day for us to gather supplies, actual physical supplies, in person, in the in-person service. Many of you have been bringing, of course, supplies out, and we have an area to gather that there at the information table. So thank you for doing that. If you plan to be with us by uh, before the 15th or on the 15th, bring those supplies with you. And of course, that's just the obvious things that are needed for school or back to school, folders and pencils and paper and all that goes along with that. Uh, but also, many of you are giving. That's what Gwen and I did. We gave and we provided uh, $20 for four, not three, but four book bags. And so that's a total of 80 that we provided. But that is uh, a way that we're able to take care of it. We're not going out and getting supplies, but we're providing the money. And then of course, those that are on staff here that are heading this up will go and take that money and pull together everything that's needed for a book bag. Let me show you what I have here. Right here is an example of one of the book bags that we have. This has got all the supplies. This is a young lady, little young lady's book bag. And it's got everything that's needed for back to school. And so as you can look in here and see, everything is there. And of course, what do we have? We, you know, we got a student that, that has what they need, or at least is starting the year off in a positive way. So help us if you would, as we're gonna to continue to make that push all the way through the 15th. And many of you are giving, so if we get there on the 15th and a couple dollars short, uh, I'm believing that either in person or on that week, we'll have everything pulled together so that we're able to make a big difference in a couple of schools, an, an elementary school, a high school, and they were working also through a parachurch or church organization called Blue Cares. I talked about it on our midweek this past week with Patrick Reed. I'll probably be talking about it a little bit more as we go further towards the 15th of this month. But a lot going on, of course, on August the 15th. And every one of you that come out are a part of our in-person service on that day, we're also going to be having ice cream for everybody. I tell you, what are we going to have? We're going to have an ice cream Sunday. Do you see how I did that right there? Ice cream Sunday. Well, if you're not ice cream, if you're not an ice cream fan, then we're going to have some juice bars and some things like that. But it's going to be a fun day to gather supplies, be in church, in person there at the AMC Theater, but then also have a special day. I think we're going to have an ice cream truck out there. It's going to be a fun day. So we hope to have you there on the 15th. On the 28th of this month, it's going to be an event, a jazz night and festival for uh, a jazz festival night for our couples. And so that's on a Saturday. I think it's the last Saturday of the month. Hope that many of you plan to be out and be a part of that. There'll be more information there on the screen. We'll be talking more about it as we get closer to the event, okay? Now today is a special day because it's the last Sunday prior to the beginning of school. So we always have prayer for our teachers, for our students, those who are a part of the, the administration. Uh, we don't wait to pray because we have to. We pray because we get to. Oftentimes we have prayer. I talked about it last year in 2020 where prayer a lot of times is something that's more of a spare tire in our life than it is a steering wheel. Steering wheel is something you use every day to drive your vehicle to where you need to go. A spare tire is something that you use sparingly. Only when things blow out, then you apply it into your life. We don't want prayer to be that in our lives. We want it to be something that's an everyday thing, not an every once in a while when things don't work and things seem to blow out in our life, then we run to the Lord in prayer. Now, the Lord is faithful to answer those prayers, but yet he's much more, should I say, um, he enjoys much more those that call and ask on him regularly and are in his presence regularly. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to pray. The Bible talks about that the prayers of righteous men and women, that they avail much. The word says that we should pray without ceasing, that he hears our prayers. It says that as well. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer today. We're going to pray over the new school year and believe that it's going to be something that is blessed, that our students are favored, that our teachers and those that are part of our church that are in the school system, Gwinnett being the largest school system uh, in the state of Georgia. But I know many of our folks, maybe you're a part of a school system outside of just Gwinnett, but we're going to pray a hedge of protection and that it's a blessed 
blessed year. I know there's still concerns going on with COVID and other things like that. That'll get worked out, but listen, God is bigger and greater than COVID and he's bigger and greater than the needs that are in your and my life. And so that's why we go to him with all of our need and then trust and watch him just provide. So let's just pray. Father, we come before you today knowing that you hear our prayers. Lord, that you respond to our prayers. Lord, that you love to hear your sons and daughters call on you. God, because we see you as the one who meets our needs, but we also know that you're loving, that you're all available, God, that you're all powerful. So Lord, we specify our prayers today, praying for this new school year that's only gonna start just in the next couple of days. But Father, we don't wait for the year to begin. We don't wait until we get down into the middle of the year and then call on you. We call on you in the beginning. We believe, God, what's done or what's accomplished or what's birthed in the beginning will manifest even greater blessing on down in the rest of the year. We're believing this prayer, Father, is a seed in the beginning of the year, and then there'll be a mighty oak of faith that'll grow into the rest of the school year, Lord, as we'll just say, look how the Lord is providing, how God is making a way. So Father, I pray with our teachers. Lord, I pray with uh, all that are in administration, Lord, from whatever job level that they are, Lord, to those that are custodial, that take care of the school, to those that are driving the buses or the lunchroom, all the way to the highest ranking school officials, officials in our county, to the important teachers right there in the class. Father, we pray favor and strength. Lord, we pray that there'll be um, health in their bodies, Lord, wholeness in their minds. God, everything that they need, they'll have. And Lord, that they'll also be able to be lights and strength to their students. And we just pray protection and a blessing to all that are part of being uh, men and women that are dedicated to educate our kids and move them on to that next level. But as well, Lord, we just pray, God, those that are believers, Lord, that like no other time before in the school system, they can truly be a light to those that are around them. Father, we now lift up all of our students from the tallest to the smallest, from the youngest to the oldest. God, we bring them before you. Lord, your word tells us that we can dedicate our children to you, that we can train them up, Lord, in godly things. And then when they get older, they'll, they'll return to it, not from it. But Father, I pray as well, Lord, as we are move them on out into, back into school, God, that we trust them into your hands, put protection around them, strengthen them, Lord. We pray that they're blessed, that they'll find favor and friendship, Lord, and that they'll get all the information that they need to move on in the next level. But Lord, let there be a level of excellence that they really walk in. Father, we pray all of this in your son's name, in the name of Jesus, knowing that when we ask, Lord, you respond, you hear. When we seek after you in areas like this, God, you're able to be found. And God, as we pray for doors to open a favor for our students and for all that are a part of the faculty and those that are part of the Gwinnett County School System, God, we know that you're not one that keeps doors closed. Lord, you open doors in your perfect timing. So Father, I pray that they're blessed from the top of their head to the soles of their feet, blessed going in, back into school, and blessing coming home, Lord, and resting and preparing, and then going again. So Father, we trust you, we thank you, we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now listen, that's a powerful prayer that I believe the Lord heard. And if you agreed with us in that prayer, and as you continue to pray, um, God's going to meet our needs. And so, uh, you know, ultimately what I've been talking about the last couple of weeks is something that's gonna go perfectly with what we just prayed. You know, God is truly in control. And we're not praying just words into the air. We're speaking to a God that has everything right there in control. It's in the palm of his hand. So open your heart now to receive the word. All right, we're gonna get right into the word today. I know you got many things I'm sure you need to accomplish on your Sunday, so we wanna make sure to get the word into your life today and then send you out ready to be all that God has called you to be. Uh, I'm gonna be back in this morning speaking, finishing up today what I've been speaking now for many, many weeks, or at least four, maybe five now, this being the fifth Sunday, talking about the idea, the thought, but the reality that God is in control. Can you say that with me Sunday morning, church? Come on, can you say that God is in control? control. He's in control. I want you to open your Bibles if you have them with me. If not, we're going to look there in, um, we're going to see it there on the screen, but I want to go to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. There's 14 verses there. The psalmist is speaking. And, and before I, I share this, I want to tell you that there was a gentleman that spoke at our church uh, many, many, uh, well, many years ago, three or four years ago. And he spoke in all the services that we had available and challenged us and, and a dynamic leader and, and an excellent man of God, a man full of character. His name is Kelvin Cochran. Uh, Kelvin uh, was at one time the head fire uh, officer of, of Atlanta. And not only that, prior to that or just before, I'm not sure if it was prior or, or before or after, but he went and actually worked with President Obama and was head of that department within, that, within the government. Uh, 
He's from Bossier City or Shreveport, Louisiana, and a real strong man of God. Led, of course, the fire department down there, and the Lord just began to promote him. Someone that would, would go on regular fast. Not that you would know that, but I've had time to speak with him and talk about the walk in his life and his relationship with the Lord. He's quick to talk about his faith, about how that his life had been radically changed. And out of that, that there was a real life of discipline that he lived, not only just to be a good man and an excellent man and a prepared man as a professional in the county or in the community or even leading on a, on a national level, but beyond that, a real excellent man of God, a believer that knew that prayer and fasting touches the heart of God, that that's how we see. The Bible says only some things in our life come out by prayer and fasting. He was sharing how that the Lord had placed this psalm in his life when he was young. And he had knew it was so much from the Lord that he committed every verse to memory. And I, he ended the service with us on that day, quoting, right? You know, didn't have to open the word, even though if he needed, he could have looked. But yet he just verbatim began to speak and declare Psalm 27, verse 1 through 14 from top to bottom and knew that that was something the Lord had given him, all the word, but yet that specifically. Here, here's what the word says. And I think it's important that you know this, that we talk about God being in control. Psalm 27 speaks about that God is, but yet that God being in control doesn't keep you and I out of circumstances that might seem totally out of control. It doesn't somehow allow you and I just to shortcut some way around or find an alternate route to escape you know, the pitfalls or the struggles, or as we talked on last Sunday, and maybe some more, more will talk about it again on this, uh, the lion's den. If you're, a da if you're a Daniel, God didn't keep Daniel from the lion's den, but he did make Daniel lion-proof in the lion's den. Amen. So we know, we see the word of God that being someone that loves God and trusts God doesn't keep you from peril, but yet God can stand with you in the midst of the storm and continue to say, peace, be still. Here's what the word says in Psalm 27. I'll read it from you. I'm going to read it for you. I want to read it from top to bottom. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength, or the Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When, not if. See what David did there. Now, not if, not praying that it wouldn't happen. He just knows it's a part of living, being on earth. When, the Bible says there, when the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing, verse 4 says, one thing I've desired of the Lord, that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time, not, not maybe, not I hope it doesn't happen, for in the time of trouble, can you say it with me? Come on, in the time of trouble, what will he do? He shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. You see that last part of verse five? Say that with me. He shall set me high upon a rock. In trouble, God's gonna put you beyond the reach of the enemy where the enemy might see you, but he cannot reach you. Come on, can I get an amen from somebody? Kelvin's not having to read it. Kelvin's got it committed to memory. And he just, he just verse after verse after verse. He goes on and, and spoke from, from memory or memorization, but it was more than just something memorized, more than a photographic memory, but something he had embodied. He knew that it was something God had given him. He went on and said, and now, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around. Therefore, I will offer sacrifice of joy in the tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praise to the Lord like we did already today. Verse 7, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not... Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God, of my salvation. When my, fa my father or my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Verse 11, I love how it ends here so powerfully. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. 
Do not deliver me to the will of my adversary, for a false witness has been risen or has risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. But look at verse 13 and 14. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So David says, you know what? Not if, but when the enemy shows up. Not, not maybe, but, but as they do show up. Wait on the Lord. And again, I say, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord, he says there, and be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Come on, if you love the word of God, can you give God a mighty praise? Amen. If you were there on that Sunday, and maybe some of you were, I know some definitely were there on that Sunday when Kelvin Cochran spoke, but he had already been fired from his position as chief of fire, I think, here in Atlanta. I don't know the actual term or the heading of his office, but he was the main guy. He was fired from his position because of a book that he had written on his own time and, and had got the okay from everyone, letting them know, not trying to keep anybody in the dark. It was about his faith. And there were a couple things that were said there that somehow just didn't sit right with some of those that were the leaders in our city, Atlanta. Just like that, they fired him. You know what? He stood as a man of faith and at that point in time was waiting for the verdict to see how it was all going to work out. Now it's come full circle and the financial recompense has come to Kelvin's side. Kelvin works as a minister down in South Atlanta and I just heard that he's taking a new job up in Virginia. I'm not sure what it's going to be, but I know that the Lord has highly favored him and used him and taken him to great places, but also he's realized life is full of ups and life is full of downs. Do you know the book that he had written, all he put in that book was related to what was already in this good book. Nothing that was somehow not connected to God's word. But not everybody's going to like what God's word says. Not everybody's going to respond to God's word. Just like Daniel, Daniel prayed three times daily and that was what was used to somehow put him in a place of peril and seeing him thrown into the den. What I saw on that Sunday morning was Kelvin saying, you know what, God had me rehearsing this scripture because there would be a time in my life where the word of God would have to stabilize me. And Psalm 27 was a stabilizing force, verse one through 14 in his life, where I'm sure there were many times in the midst of that struggle and uncertainty where he had to lean back on that idea that I would have lost heart, verse 13, unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So he went on and said there, the psalmist did, saying, you know what, so because of that, I'm not going to try to rush out and try to fix it myself. I'm not going to somehow try to handle this on my own. I am not going to in any way try to seek some other answer than seeking the face of God. I will wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen my heart. I will wait on the Lord. Today I can tell you, as Kelvin waited on God, God showed up, God made a way. When he was in that den of lions, God kept him. God has brought him up and out, and now God has continued to promote him. I'm telling you today to say that God is in control is not something that somehow gets us out of jail free, if you will. It's not a card where we just turn in and say, you know what, I don't want to go through this struggle and trial. No, when you say God is in control, you're saying, I know there will be moments and issues in my life where Jerichos and giants and Red Seas show up, where the enemy attacks, or maybe I make a, a tragic mistake and a bad decision. But I believe today God is in control. And just as Romans 8 and 28 says, God has the power to take all the good and the bad, work it all together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Who believes that our God is fully and totally in control today? Come on, give your God a hand clap if you believe that. God is good, amen. <laughs> Referring to Daniel, Kevin found himself in a Daniel-like situation, but God delivered him. God provided for him. God also provided for Daniel. Daniel was in an out of control situation. But let me give you the end of the story. Daniel chapter six, verse 33 tells us now that Daniel's being brought out of the den. The word says that King Darius said this, the king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted out from the den. I love the description the Bible gives here. It says that not a scratch was found on him or on Daniel. Why? Because he trusted in his God. Kelvin stood in the pulpit and talked about how that he was in a process of ongoing trusting God. 
it had not yet been resolved, but I now see the full tell or the end and all of that story, and I've seen how God has fought for Kelvin and made a way for him. And I look in the word of God, and I see how God fought for Daniel and took care of him. The Bible says because he trusted God, because he believed that God was in control, because he had seen it with his own eyes years before when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his good, godly friends, had also stood and trusted God and declared by their words, but more importantly, their actions, that God was in control. Even when Nebuchadnezzar turned that fiery furnace up seven times hotter than it was already, and they were cast into that furnace, the Bible tells us that Nebuchadnezzar saw a fourth man in the fire, and those three Hebrew boys came out not only healed and whole in their body. They were not harmed, but they didn't even have the smell of smoke upon them. Can I tell you that our God is so in control that he can keep you in the midst of a hot furnace seven times hotter and cause you to come out not even smelling like where you have been or what you have been surrounded by. Our God is a way-making God, a mountain-moving God, a God that is all-powerful, and I'm gonna say it, and I'm gonna give the devil a black eye when I do. God is in control. Come on, somebody. Can somebody give our God praise? The Bible says that Darius said, man, bring him out. You know, Darius, King Darius fasted all night. He wasn't a godly person. He was more in love with himself. The very thing that put Daniel into the den was the leaders that were jealous of Daniel said, you know what, no one should pray for a full month other than to you, Darius. And Darius said, that's an outstanding idea. Let me sign that into law. But their objective was knowing that Daniel prayed three times a day to the God of Israel, that he was so faithful and devout believing that God was in control, that even though it was written in the law that you cannot pray to anyone else but Darius, Daniel would pray to the God of Israel. The Bible tells us that just when that law was written, when it was heard, Daniel did just what he had always done. He went and opened the windows and turned towards Israel and he began to pray where he was in a foreign land and a captive, but yet he prayed to the God of Israel. It put him in that lion's den Darius realized that he had been set up and taken advantage of, that they had used him to somehow inflict pain upon Daniel. And the Bible says that this king fasted all night for his friend, didn't sleep at all, fasted the whole night for his friend. But when the morning came, and how many of you know that weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning, that when the morning came, he said, oh, Daniel, did your God save you? And at the bottom of that den, Daniel said, my God is in control. And verse 33 tells us that Daniel, our King Darius said, bring Daniel up and out. And then he said, there wasn't a scratch nor was there anything harmed on him. Why? Because Daniel trusted in his God. Come on, can I get an amen today? I'm gonna challenge you to believe that God is in control, full control of your life, and what I have to alert you to is to give no room for the enemy. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter four, verse 27, to give no foothold to the enemy, no, no way to hold on and somehow scale and climb, but to somehow repel him with your trust and your reliance in God. This scripture here in Ephesians chapter four, verse 27, prior to that talks about anger. Do you know oftentimes the reason why we're so full of anger and frustration is because we feel that things are out of control or beyond our control. And so there's frustration, there's anger, and what does it do? It creates a foothold for the enemy. I never read, now listen, listen, you gotta hear this. There are many times in the word of God where there are good godly people that the Lord uses that have a lot of flaws. And I'm thankful for that because I need to see God's grace just like I'm sure a lot of y'all do as well, amen. Amen. And I see it played through the life of those that were broken but God works through them. But there are certain biblical characters, not that they're perfect people, but the scriptures are silent with anything in their life that seems to be out of step. Daniel is one of those that we never see him at a point of sin, not saying that he was sinless, but yet when you hear and read about his life, he was a good man. He should not have been put in a situation like this. But yet the Bible tells us that he was placed into that lion's den. But even though he was in the lion's den, we never hear him complaining. We never hear him railing against God. We never hear him cursing at God. We never see him turning his back on God. We never see him quitting on God. See, Daniel's faith, everybody say faith. See, to say that God is in control is to more than a word say, I'm willing to live by faith. 
Daniel's faith showed us when we're in the lion's den that we're called to stand strong, thank God, and not complain. When we're in the lion's den, we're called to be good people and to not let bitterness somehow swallow our heart. When we are in the lion's den, we are to be at peace and not full of panic and worry. Now, I know when you hear that, many of you, just like myself, find myself on the wrong side of that column. Too often, I'm at a point of being bitter. Too often, I find myself complaining. Too often, I feel myself more full of panic than I do peace. But I see the word of God that Daniel was a man just like I'm a man today. And the same God that put faith in the life of Daniel and brought him up and out without a scratch because he trusted in God is a God that also looks on you and me through grace. It says, I know your heart. I know your life. I'm not going to keep you from experiences, but I'm going to keep you in the midst of them and bring you through and out onto the other side. Amen. But we need to look to the word of God and let Daniel be an example of how we need to live from this point forward. To let our life be a life that's not full of panic and dread. There's going to continue to be headlines out there and things that are said, but I don't know about you. God's in control. I'm going to trust God all the way. There's going to be a lot of things out there that will cause our attention to be drawn away way. First, keep your eyes on the Lord, then look at everything else. Don't look at everything else, then somehow look at God. Keep God first. Stand strong because what it does, it sends a message to the enemy and it sends a message to everyone around you that you are trusting God because God is in control. Who believes today that we serve a God that can allow Daniel to be put into the lion's den but make him lion proof and on the day after he spent a whole day and a night in the lion den that he was brought out without a scratch and that he was brought out because he trusted God. Who believes that today? Come on, if you believe that God is in control, the God of Daniel is your God, come on, can you make a joyful noise Noise unto the Lord. There might not be a lion's den waiting for you, but there might be a debt collector. There might be a sickness in your body. There might be a broken relationship. There might be bad decisions that you made and you hear the roar of the lion. Come on, trust God. Cast all your care on him. Lean on him in all your ways. Acknowledge him. And our God will bring you up and out and through to testify that God is a good God. I trusted God and God made the way where there is no way. Let me give you just a point today. Number one point, you can't rush what God is doing. Too often what happens, we want to say on a Sunday morning, God's in control. Then we want to rush God along, push God along to get done what we feel needs to get done. You can't rush God. How many know if you can't rush a good meal being cooked, if you want just food, then hey, go to the microwave or go to McDonald's, right? But a real meal takes a while, right? How many know that a crock pot is whole, a whole lot better than a microwave? Amen. Now, you might get a hot pocket and it can keep you for a night and fill your belly, but pot roast is a whole lot better. Come on, can I get an amen from somebody? See, if I can't rush a great cook, then how can I think that I'm going to somehow rush God? If there's a great artisan that is painting a picture or sculpting something, I can't rush them in what they're creating, and I also cannot dare rush God. If I say God is in control, how dare I try to rush God, the greatest of all artists, the greatest of all physicians, the one true and living God, for him to create what he wants to create in and out of me and through my life and in and out and through your life. Don't rush God. You and I, instead of trying to rush God, let's trust God. Come on, somebody. Can I get an amen? You cannot rush God. But hear this. When we worry, and that's what happens, things aren't happening quick enough. Our things start to happen opposite of what we would think. Daniel goes back to pray. And in praying and trusting God, it puts him in the den. If we're rushing God or trying to get our plans accomplished, then that will not compute. And before you know it, we're full of worry, and worry will only tie the hands of the almighty God that we serve. See, we're always going to face bigger situations. I love Psalm 27 because it doesn't say it won't happen. It just says when they show up on your doorstep, as this takes place in your life, when real life outside of these four walls is in full effect, God is still God. See, you're always going to be facing bigger situations, bigger things like, a medical report, that's bigger than you. I could not have fixed this on my own. I remember one day in washing my hair, feeling a bump that hadn't been there the day before. 
And I realize, well, I'm getting older, but is this a part of that? Amen. I don't know. But as it stayed and didn't go, and I realized I need to have this checked out. I, I could know what it is, and I could know how to uh, attack it, but I needed a professional to help me remove this to make sure today I could stand here knowing that I'm in the healing process now, but what I had, I no longer have. It was bigger than me. I needed help. Do you see where I'm going today? See, there's going to be things that are bigger than you, medical reports, loss of loved ones. It's bigger than you. We cope and we work through it, but ultimately you have to cast your care and your care is in the hands of your God. Put all of those concerns on him. Trust him. And if you're a believer and that loved one was a believer, then you know you're going to see them again. We sit here as a family today, myself, Gwenny, mom and dad, my sons that are in the building, and two days from today will be a 35-year anniversary that my brother was killed by a drunk driver. There have been some horrible nights. There have been some overwhelming moments. Let me tell you, then and still today, it is bigger than us, but we know what it is to have a God that will put us on a rock too high for the enemy to reach, that will keep us and have us at a point of peace even when the world is swirling. What do I see on this Sunday morning? 35 years later, mom and dad still love God. 35 years later, Gwen and I still trust God. 35 years later, my boys are still in God's house. Why? Because God is still in control. Come on, somebody. Can I get an amen? Loss of life, loss of people. That's bigger than us. Medical reports are bigger than us. Business struggles are bigger than us. We're going to run into the proverbial walls when we don't know what to do. We're not sure how we should answer. We're not sure what tomorrow will hold. That's where you have to get it in your heart, deep down inside of you, that you're not out here to rush God and push God along. You're out here to trust God and follow God. Let God lead, let God guide. And if you don't fall in the den, keep on praying. And when you fall in the den, for sure keep on praying. But God will bring those out who trust him without a scratch, why? Because I just gotta remind somebody and myself once again, God is in control. Come on, somebody. Somebody give him praise today if you want to be sold out to your Savior. Amen. I saw this just the other day. It's comical. Softly playing out, if you would. Um, you got it there for me, Austin, I think. I saw this picture the other day. And, you know, Kevin Hart's here on my very far right, your left. Kevin's not known to be a big guy, you know, muscular and works out, but he's diminutive, you know. That's a big word for height challenge. Come on, can I get an amen? I just gave you a new word to head home with. Diminutive. He's by the rock. We know him to be a big dude, right? Getting bigger every day. You know what? There's always something bigger. We got Kevin Hart and we got the rock. The rock is the biggest guy I feel like I'd ever know, but put him next to Shaq. And look how little he looks. And look how little Shaq looks to Yao Ming. My goodness, look at somebody say it ain't right. Tell somebody it ain't right. I mean, I'm not sure what height he is, five something, but I know he's seven four standing by seven one. That's big. Come on, can I get an amen? On every day, that's big. All I'm trying to show you is, is that you're never going to run out of things that are bigger than you. That's why you need to just say, you know what, God? There's going to always be something a little bigger, something to worry about, something to be uncertain about, but I'm not going to rush you, God. I'm going to trust you, God. I'm not going to try to get my will done. I want your will to be done. I want to have the faith of Daniel so that when you don't deliver the way I think you should and difficulty shows up, Father, I realize you're working it all together for my good that you're bringing me through with a greater testimony of look what the Lord has done. You're bringing me through on the other side where I I didn't know where you were headed. I thought you'd lost your mind. I thought you'd forgot about me, but I realized you had a better way. Your ways were higher than mine. Your thoughts were better than mine. Your plans were laid out better than what I could ever, ever even conceive. See, Daniel's faith kept him not out of the den of lions, but his faith made him lion proof. And what we need today in the day that we live are men and women who realize just as God gave David the lion and the bear and Goliath, we need good godly people, not manby pamby people, but good godly people to leave this building and say, just like David, just like Daniel, God will give me the bear, God will give me the lion, God will give me the giant because greater, come on somebody, is he that lives inside of me, come on somebody, than he that is in the, 
That's right. Come on, somebody, give him praise. Oh, come on, somebody, on a Sunday morning at AMC Theater, give your God praise. Come on, magnify God. Come on, praise God. Come on, thank God. Stir up the gift of God within you. The bigger will be waiting. The problems will be waiting. If you leave here with a good word, but you don't leave here with God, you are not prepared. If you leave here, get Lear in a sermon and singing some songs, you are not prepared. You need to leave here knowing no matter what tomorrow holds, God holds my tomorrow. No matter what I face, God is in my day. No matter what I deal with, if I do not lose heart, I will reap a harvest, the word of God declares. Oh, Rasataba, come on, God is good. Come on, somebody, just praise break. Come on, give him praise. Hallelujah. What I'm saying is just don't sing a song on Sunday morning. Just don't get a sermon on Sunday morning. Just don't feel like you did a favor for God on Sunday morning. Second point, live from a place of peace. Live from a place of, come on, help me. Live from a place of, years ago I was on staff down in Savannah, Georgia as a youth pastor. I met a guy from North Carolina. I don't know if it's a North Carolinian thing or not. But you know, throughout our nation, there's different ways of saying things, different types of accents, and, and even a way of even saying a little differently. I met William Clements, a good guy. He was brother-in-law of the pastor I was working for, Ken Hall. William came up to me and said, hey, where you stay? Well, I'm, Gwen and I are staying in that, that little parsonage now as the youth pastors that's behind the church. That's we. He goes, no, 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 where you from? Now, I know if it's a Carolina thing or not. If we got some Carolinians here in the Tar Heels here in the, in the building, you can tell me later on if that's right or not. But I didn't understand he was saying it first. But he was saying, where am I from? Where, where you stay? Well, it made me think today in talking about living from a place of peace. I need to ask you today, where, where, where do you stay? Where, where you, where, not, not just where you're from, but where do you stay? Where do you stay? You need to stay at a point of peace. You know, a point of peace that puts you into the place where you can declare like David did in Psalm 23 and verse 4, where he says right there in the Word of God, look there, 23 and verse 4, right in the middle of that he said, I will fear no evil for you are with me. David is saying right in the middle of the valley of the shadow of death, right there in the middle of uncertain times, right there at the moment where things are without control or direction, and he just says, my God is in control. I, I'm not just from peace, I'm living in peace. And I will not fear for God is continually ever present on time with me. Come on, does anybody hear what the word of God is saying? Some maybe in this building are convinced that God doesn't care. Matthew 10 and 29, the word tells us, Matthew's gospel declares, are you not, are, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And it goes on and says, and, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's eye. I think the New Living Translation basically says it this way, that a single sparrow can fall to the ground, but it can't fall to the ground without your father knowing it. My God, if he sees the little bird that falls to the ground and somehow is harmed, how much more does he care about those that are created in his image to carry his glory that he calls sons and daughters on the earth? I guess what I'm trying to tell you today is not only is it something that you and I cannot rush God, but in really loving and trusting and follow God, we got to live from and we got to live in peace. And when we live in peace, that means we got to quit some things. Look at somebody next to you and say, you got to quit. Come on, look at somebody and say, quit. Tell somebody, quit. Quit worrying. Quit losing sleep. Quit being upset. Quit being controlled by your circumstance. Quit being controlled by what everybody says. Quit being controlled what the highlight or the new line is of the day. Trust in your God. God is in control. Don't rush God. Trust God. Live from, live in, walk in peace because the peace of God will surpass all understanding. Come on. Can somebody give your God a hand clap today? Somebody magnify your God. Enrique, I think you got that deal over there. Am I right? Come get this table from me if you would. We did it last week. We're going to do it again this week. Last week with the Baldwin family, but everyone in here, I provided a rock. That's what he has right here. 
He's going to put it by the door. This rock represents the fact that David, unqualified, not prepared, young man went out to meet someone when he looked like Kevin Hart going out to face Yao Ming. And he had never fought a battle against a man. He had never waged war. At most, he had learned just how to work a sling. Sure, he would take the lion and the bear, and that was God's favor. But it's a whole other thing when you have a thinking man with height and strength and experience, a spear and a, and a sword, and he's cursing you and cursing your God. I'm challenging you today. Listen, you, you can't rush God. Can you put that first point back up there, Austin? Say this with me. Come on. You can't rush what God's doing. Second point, put that up there if you would. Live from a place of, and then lastly today, just look at this. Now, hold on to this. Believe this. Come on, say it with me. God is working his plan. When David showed up to fight the enemy, he showed up. You know what he showed up with? He didn't show up with a plan. If you know the story, David showed up with provisions for his brothers. David showed up with cheese sandwiches. He showed up at lunch. His father said, hey, you know what? Go see what's going on at the front with your brothers and here, take some lunch to them. David showed up not as a man, a warrior, but a shepherd. And he didn't have one weapon. His sling was just stuck in his back pocket because he always had it with him, but he had lunch. Did you ever think the young man would show up to take out the giant and all he had was a bag lunch. But when he heard what the man was saying and how he was cursing God, and don't miss this, David also realized a good opportunity. He also knew this, he said, because he knew God was big, God was strong, God was in control, God was in charge. He'd lived from and lived in peace, he knew that. He also knew this, listen, remember, he knew that the prophet had showed up to his house and had anointed him to be king. All of his brothers had walked in front and the Bible says, Samuel said, not that one, not that one, not that one. He says, is there anybody else? David had not even been invited to the party and then they stopped everything, brought him in and the Bible says that man of God poured the anointing off from the top of his head to the soles of his feet and said, you are now, you will be the next king. David might have showed up with lunch, but more than lunch, David showed up with a destiny. Come on, can I get an Amen. How do I know God's got a plan for you? You are still six feet above today. There's still breath in your body. God is still on the throne and God is still in charge. Can I get an amen? God has a plan for your life. Say it with me. God is working his, come on somebody boldly. What God is, one more time. Come on, God. Now live from and in peace. Don't rush God, trust God. David showed up with destiny on his life but he only had cheese sandwiches but he heard someone talking about his God and then he said well, what will be given to the man that takes that guy out and then he heard the hand of the king's daughter and paying no taxes how many know that no tax thing would be an awesome thing amen he would immediately get a level of authority and no taxes for him and the rest of his family David didn't show without an agenda. That destiny was something God had placed in his heart. Listen, God puts things in your heart to see great and mighty things happen. But when you show up unprepared or ill-equipped or it's not my time, listen, God is working his plan. The Bible even tells us that Saul said, here, take my armor, put it on. David put it on and it didn't fit right. David said, you know, at the end of the day, God is the one that anointed me. God is the one that protected me out in the field with the sheep. And God is the one that's gonna bring me down into this valley to take out this giant. He took off all the armor. He put down the bag with the cheese sandwiches. He went down to a little brook and he said, God, this is the way you've always worked. Lord, you've always just led me, God. Now just give me a little bit of your word, God. Look, give me a little bit of your power and your direction. He reached down into a brook and found a smooth stone and four more with it. I don't know if it was for the four brothers of Goliath. I'm not sure. Or I thought it was so big it'd take four stones. I don't know. But all I know is he reached down and pulled out smooth stones, which is a reflection of God's word. It is a foundation to you and my life. It is a mighty stone to stand on in the time of storm. And when it comes and passes, you'll be left standing by the power of God. Come on, can I get an amen from somebody? God is good. God is in control. Hey. 
And then he took nothing but that sling and that stone. One little stone. Can I tell you, it might just be one little prayer, but God hears your prayers and God responds. It might be just one phone call to tell somebody that you forgive them or that you seek forgiveness and then what has been broken for years is healed. It might just be one little gift that you give as an offering or a tithe. God deal with your heart and it go to make the difference that you could never imagine. Don't despise small beginnings. Don't somehow not consider the small. God takes the loaves and the fishes. God takes takes the young David and promotes him and God will take hope in life and God will take you in my life and use it for his glory if we'll not try to rust him, I mean rush him but trust him, if we'll not live in panic but from and in peace and if we wait on God and let God work his plan. David went down and heard all the enemy had to say. That enemy said, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to feed your body to the birds of the air. And I'm going to let everybody know that the God of Israel is not real. Nothing but a fake, phony, broke down God. And David got some boldness and said, now today, everybody's going to know. Not by the hand of David. Nor by the hand of the army that's all hiding out behind me. But by the one true and living God. With a little boy and a little stone, God will work his plan. And the Bible said it hit him, he fell, but I like that David doesn't just try to get the job done, he does the job all the way. He shows up, looks over him, doesn't check his pulse, doesn't see if he's breathing, he pulls out that big old sword. He's a little boy, y'all. You know he had to run to get to it, right? He couldn't just lift it. He's a young boy, he pulled out that giant sword, went running, took the head of that giant. And from that point on, the enemy had to run and hide and everyone knew that there was one true and living God. I'm speaking today to folks who can look at walls of Jericho and giants tall and strong, but I want to tell you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God will use a little thing to knock the giant out, and then he'll put the very sword of the enemy in your hand to take the head of that giant. God is bigger than anything bigger in your life today. God is more powerful than anything that says it's powerful in your life today. Trust God. Don't rush God. Live from and in peace. There is peace that God provides. And come on, if you believe it and you know it. God, say with me, God is working his, come on somebody, God, he's working his plan with your children. He's working his plan with your marriage. He's working his plan with our church. He's working his plan in our community and in our world. Don't be caught off guard. God was not asleep at the wheel when the world all of a sudden got shook up two years ago now almost. God knows exactly what he's doing and whatever can be shaken, let it be shaken and everything else that remains, stand on it and say, if God is for us, who can be against us? Come on church, God is in control. If you believe that, give your mighty God a praise. Come on, give him praise. Hallelujah. 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 God is working his plan in your medical health. God is working his plan with loss and brokenness. God is working his plan. Today in this house, you'd say, Pastor, you know what? I, I had to be here today. I, I thought I, I was making plans to be here, but God was working his plan to have me here. I had to hear this. This spoke to me. I feel challenged. I can't just leave with a song. I just can't leave with a sermon. I got to leave here with peace. I got to leave here with a knowing that I can't rush God. I got to trust God. I got to leave here knowing that God has not quit on me. He sees the sparrow fall. He knows me. God is working his plan in my life. Who here today would say, Pastor, I, 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 I had to hear it, and I believe today God is working his plan in my life. If that's you right now, more than just a good preach and a good song, but you, you know it, you had to be here to acknowledge that God is still in control. He's still involved. He sees you, knows your name and the number of hair on your head, and he's got a plan for your life and he has not quit on you, but you need to acknowledge that. If that's you right now, raise your hand. If you acknowledge that, raise your hand. Come on, stand to your feet if that's you. If you raised your hand, stand to your feet as a mighty army. Come on, stand to your feet as a mighty army. If you already got peace in your heart, you're living from it, All the, that's fine. But those that know they had to be here today and you heard this by the sound of heaven into your heart, come on, stand to your feet, raise your hands to heaven right now. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, I see this mighty army. And Father, I believe just as Ezekiel saw a valley of bones, Father, I believe he said, I hear the Spirit saying, speak now over them. Let life come forth. Father, we speak over what's been scattered, what's been destroyed, God, what's been broken, what, what's, what's been spoken over as if it is death or dead and it is over. The devil is an absolute liar today. Father, they're not here by accident, but yet to hear this word. And Ezekiel was challenged to speak the word. And when he spoke that word, he began to work over those bones and they came back together. Father, in the name of Jesus, work your plan over our life. Would you say that with hands raised, standing to your feet, those that are standing, just say, Lord, work your plan. Come on, say, Lord, I'm not gonna rush you. I'm gonna follow you. I'm going to trust you. Lord, help me to be from and live in continual peace. I am leaning on you. Father, now in the name of Jesus, I declare over their lives what has been scattered, what has been broken, what has somehow seemingly been dead and gone. God, begin now to restore. God, begin to open doors. God, begin to make a way where there is no way. Father, we fully, flat out, totally trust you in all of our ways. In Jesus' mighty name, come on now. Would you just praise him with your hands raised? Just praise him. Psalm 105, verse 1. Would you put that up there, Austin? Psalm 105, verse 1. How do we activate the plan? How do we stay in the plan? When you feel worry, worship. When you get up on Monday, worship. When you get up on Tuesday, worship. When you get to Wednesday afternoon, hump day, worship. When you're riding in traffic on Thursday, worship. On Friday, when you're, you're getting up and thinking it's the week, worship. When it's Saturday and you're cutting the grass, worship. Show up in here next Sunday full of worship because David said this, oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Come on, Father, we worship you today. We magnify you today, Lord. We glorify you today, God. You are worthy. You are in control. Come on, say it. Lord, you are worthy. Lord, you're in control. In Jesus' mighty name, God's church said amen and amen. There is a takeaway. As you leave out today, some of you got one last week. Hopefully you haven't misplaced it. Who got a rock last week? Raise your hand if you got one. Hopefully you got, maybe on the nightstand or you brought it with you. I, I'll keep mine with me. Just as a touch point, there's nothing in this. It's nothing. It's a rock. But I know it connects me to something in the Word of God where God did something amazing for a young man that should have died in that field that day. But watch and see what our God did. If God did it for David, he's going to do it for you. Amen? Amen. So if you didn't get one, they're right over there. Enrique's got one. It's right there. Make sure to take one home with you, and it can represent everything that you feel is the Yao Ming in your life. Come on, can I get an amen? But have me know, God is still bigger. Come on, somebody, amen? So make sure you get one if you didn't. If you did, then keep it, hold on to it, keep confessing life, health, peace, joy, because what is God? God is what? He is what? He is in He's what? Tell somebody. He's what? Tell somebody. He, hey, come on, look at three folks and just, let's start a rumor. Come on, turn around to somebody and say, you know what? I heard God's in control. You, you know, I heard somebody say God's in control. Have you heard what I heard? I heard what he and she said. They said God is what? God's it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. He be gracious to you. Lift his countenance upon you and give you peace and cover you with the name bigger and better than any other name. That is the name of and Jesus provides hope for today and life for your tomorrows. We love you. Have an amazing Sunday afternoon. Take this with you as your point of contact and prayer. Follow Pastor Avery out. He'll lead you on out. I'll see you out front. God bless you guys. We love you. Have a great Sunday afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for our worship experience. We pray that you were blessed by the word and the worship. At the bottom of your screen, there's an email address. If you have any prayer requests or any needs of any kind, we would love to stand in agreement with you. As well, we would love for you to follow us on our social media platforms, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. And in the middle of this week, when you need something to just kind of lift your spirits, tune in for our midweek meetup. Until we see you next week, church, we love you.